Our whole discussion so far has been leading up to this topic because choice, as we have discussed, is the central point in integrity, in individuality, in exercising our free will, and becoming an authentic human being in the full sense of the term. In general, care for the world and the things in the world is an inadequate basis for choice. It always leaves us at the effect of external factors, and in that way we can never attain integrity or authenticity. Our discussion of death shows that the awareness of impending death provides a basis for integrity because it gives us a qualitative standard for identifying those possibilities that are uniquely our own. It also shows that choosing for the world is completely inauthentic because the world as a whole never shows up in our clearing, only the objects and persons in the world. And if we do choose for the world, it robs us of our self-determination, energy, attention, and authenticity, because we can never be completely ourselves. Integrity is required for authentic being. Without being a whole person, without being a human being in the full sense of the term, with all the functions and activities and qualities of a human being, then we don't have integrity, and so how can we be authentic? Integrity is the subject of one of our advanced courses where we go into the definition of integrity and how to maintain one's integrity in great detail. Now, we don't use the typical normative virtue model of integrity based on right and wrong, good and bad in various domains. We use a positive model of integrity and we will discuss that, uh, or we will present that, rather, in uh, Part 7, in the conclusions. And, uh, as I said, we go into that model in great detail in our advanced courses. We define integrity not as a moral quality or virtue, but as the state or condition of being whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition. When our human beingness is in perfect condition, complete and whole, unbroken, unimpaired and sound, we have integrity. But for that, we have to recover our authentic being. We have to be the unique individual that we are without compromising with the world. It's not just the present moment or the choices or possibilities that are before us now that matters. Our life as a whole matters. To have completion and integrity, to have authentic being, the quality of our whole life is at stake in each of our choices. Each of our choices has to contribute to our life as a whole and be seen in the context of our life as a whole. And of course, that means in the presence of impending death. Our phenomenological analysis reveals that our human life and activities comprise an unbreakable unity. We are the same person that is born from the womb in the beginning of our life, and we are the same person who dies at the end of our life. So we need a basis for choice that gives us access to the unity and completeness of our existence. And the question is, if we simply choose based on our personal preferences, desires, habits, or inclinations, uh, then should we aim for a consistent set of choices or should we choose as many different varieties of experiences as we can to try to have a complete experience of human beingness? Now this diagram shows 
our model of integrity as a positive value. Integrity as a positive value has the advantage of being measurable. We can measure how much integrity or what percentage of integrity a person has by how well they honor their word. And we go into this in great detail in the integrity course. Philosophy and theology, a traditional view, is that integrity is a normative value. And uh, indeed, there are normative values of integrity in the uh, moral or social domain, in the organizational and governmental domain. But then the question arises, whose morality, which ethics, and what country's legality we should use as the standard for integrity? Because these things uh, give us the measure of integrity, they should be consistent, but they're not. It's the only consistent measure of integrity that we can find to answer the question, how much integrity do we possess? Is it only answerable when we consider integrity as a positive value? It's just like saying, how much money do you have? It's measurable. It's quantifiable. So again, if we use an external standard to determine the quality of our choices, if it comes from theology, which theology? Or what religion? Or whose culture are we using as the standard? And these questions cannot be resolved because they're a matter of individual conditioning, cultural embeddedness, and taste. When we look at it from an ontological point of view, any system of choice based on an external standard means caring about the other more than about ourselves. And when we do that, we compromise our integrity, we lose our authenticity, and we also lose uh, an objective, measurable, concrete, positive standard against which we can measure our integrity. The values based on external standards reduce our integrity because we become fragmented. We become split between our interests and the interests of the world. And the interests of the world are manifold and mutually contradictory and conflicting. This reduces our integrity and reduced integrity reduces freedom energy, intelligence, and ability. In other words, our productivity, our creativity, our energy, and our attention all are reduced by fragmentation and we become much less productive than we are when we are whole. Some people advocate that our personal aims and desires should be the standard for our choice. Just do whatever you feel like. Do whatever you want. However, these uh, inclinations are not stable enough to give us a life of integrity and authenticity. They change all the time. Just think of the things that you thought were cool when you were uh, a child versus the things that you think are cool now. And you'll see that your desires have changed tremendously in that time. At least, I hope so. But personal aims and desires are certainly part of our life. But the part cannot give meaning to the whole. In other words, our little aims and desires and our petty needs and individual daily activities and so on aren't the whole of our life. They're only part of our life. So how can they determine the meaning of our whole life that's going to be ultimately unsatisfying? Actually, this point highlights the fact that it's not what we choose, but our ability to choose that gives meaning to our life. And that's a better idea, but still, choice is only a part of human life. It's more important, but it still cannot give the meaning of our whole life. So then traditional philosophy goes a step further and says, well, if choice is what gives meaning to our life, then we should make a choice to commit to something greater than ourselves. That way, 
uh, the meaning of our life will become stable because now it's not depending on our changing whims and tastes. But there's some external measurable standard that how well did we maintain our commitment to something greater that, that like a relationship, a group, a cause, a religion, a philosophy, and so on. Well, that is a base, better basis for choice than our individual tastes, but it's still external. That means it will still fragment us and diminish our integrity because a created self, any kind of a self that we make for ourselves out of choices based on external factors will always be synthetic and therefore inauthentic. So traditional morality, commitment, let's say, uh, to a country, a, a political stance or school, uh, a religion, a philosophy, or some kind of cause that's greater than oneself is also good, but because, again, choice is simply a part of who we are, the part cannot give meaning to the whole. Another point is that our choice can be arbitrary. The same person in a different circumstances might make a completely different choice, depending on the possibilities that are available in the external situation. So if choice is more or less arbitrary, what gives choice its meaning? And how can something that has no intrinsic meaning of its own give meaning to our entire existence? Now, it's true that our life as a whole must derive meaning from something beyond it. But what is there that is greater than our life that also has the same quality as our existence and will not force us to reduce our integrity? Well, traditional philosophy suggests that God is this transcendental source of meaning, that God, by creating the scriptures, gives a certain standard of moral activity, right and wrong, and then we have to follow that standard, and when we do, our life is given its ultimate meaning by this external authority. So this is traditional theological standard, uh, but the translation of that in the ontological terms is that you must submit to an external standard of morality based on ecclesiastical authority. It's still not experiential. It's still not ontological. It's still not phenomenological. It's still not based on our experience. And although it's something beyond us that has a similar quality to our being, it still translates down to an external standard. So we solve this problem in our analysis of our relation with death because we can relate our whole life to something that is beyond it, giving an adequate context for the meaning of the whole of our life, but that also shows up within it. And the only thing like that that we know so far is death. The authentic relation to death provides an absolute transcendental standard with which every choice in our life can be related. In other words, death has the same quality as the authentic possibilities that are completely our own. Uh, death is the own most. It's a non-relational standard. It's inevitable. And just like everyone has their own nature, their own taste and their own style of doing things, or they should. Death gives us an absolute standard with which to compare our choices and our possibilities to determine which ones are uniquely our own. So by relating our life as a whole to our death, this solves the problems of integrity and authenticity caused by requiring an external standard for choice.
because death shows up within our life as an authentic possibility, but it's also something that is beyond our existence. The problem with comparing our choices to some transcendental, infinite standard that's viewed as outside of the world or outside of our existence is that it implies a limitation rather than a limit to our existence. It implies that we can never attain anything beyond our present finite being in the world. If you think about it, if God is so much higher and so much greater than our human existence, then how can we ever rise to that standard? Uh, it seems like an impossible thing. And this is why religious people remain stuck in inauthentic being. For one thing, they're taking a, a standard that's outside of their own selves as a requirement for their choices. And for another thing, they're taking the perfection of God as an unattainable standard because it's outside of the world in which we live. Our being is in the world, and as long as we're in the world, we're never going to be perfect. But we can uh, approach perfection by attaining integrity within ourselves. Without this integrity, religion and morality will always degenerate into ordinary being in the world. And we see this in so many cases where so-called religious authorities, priests and gurus and so on, start to act just like businessmen or politicians or ordinary people with ordinary desires and motives. And they lose whatever uh, purity or perfection they have because deep down they believe that they can never attain the standard Now, this doesn't mean that we advocate atheism or agnosticism. We don't. Actually, uh, we don't accept nihilism either, or nihilistic and impersonal forms of religion. But we do accept the forms of theology and spiritual life that do not conflict with the individual's freedom of choice and that provide an objective measurable standard of integrity that an individual can live up to in their practical life without requiring them to surrender to some external standard. In other words, we are creating an experiential platform for theism. That means direct personal experience of the deity. And this experience can be had by anyone who is willing to go through the process of collecting their scattered parts of themselves from the world into an authentic, integral whole, making choices based on their unique individuality and comparing them with, in the light of their mortality to their limitations, their finitude, the fact that they're going to die. And this opens up the possibility of a direct personal experience of God. And that is where we're going with this. That is what we want to help people attain. Recall a time when you chose fully for yourself. How did you feel? Recall a time when you chose for the other. How was that different? Do you use an external standard of choice? Which one? If you were to choose only for yourself, how would you choose differently? Get clear that integrity as a normative virtue is unmeasurable. Does your life as a whole have a meaning? What is it? Are you a religious person? How do you deal with the essential hypocrisy of religious morality? Over time, have you seen that you and others get better at following external standards of morality and choice? If so, or if not, why or why not? 
Recall a time in your life when you changed your desires. How did that affect your choices? Have you ever tried to be something you're not? How did it affect you? Thank you.